So uh, the title of this presentation, uh, if you read it, you're probably a little confused or curious what it means. Uh, hopefully I'll explain it here. Um, the gist I want everyone to get from this is this is not going to be a highly technical. Uh, it's going to be something where uh, it's just a situation that I think a lot of us have been placed in. Um, and sometimes creativity can be uh, one of those things that backfire. So let's start. So one of my favorite quotes is, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And I think any of you that work in security will kind of agree with me. Um, the principle that you know, just because you don't see an intruder or you don't see a flaw in the way you've configured your network or you don't see it doesn't mean that something like that doesn't exist. If it didn't, none of us would have jobs in here. <laughs> so it's one of those things that I, I've loved. So we try to, try to reiterate that with a lot of our clients coming through. So who am I? My name is Christopher O'Rourke. I'm the founder and CEO of a local security company here in Charleston called Centaria. We've also got offices in San Francisco and uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, we handle incident response, security consulting, uh, just pretty much every gamut. But our big forte is in kind of hunt team operations or uh, tracking down nation state threat actors. Um, we don't use the buzzwords like APT and cyber because I, mean, I think everyone in here hates those words. But our forte is, is simply tracking that down. And there's a reason why uh, I believe we're better than everyone else at that. Uh, and I'll explain that here uh, with a little bit of my background. So. Where have I worked? What have I done? I apologize. It looks like the text is in black here. So I was in the United States Army, where I was a uh, 35 Sierra, which is a signal collector's intelligence analyst. My job was to break microwave frequencies, uh, break satellite communications, um, basically exploit anything that could send a signal. I spent a little bit of time there, did field operations all over northern Africa, uh, your traditional uh, fun places that we've been in the past few years, uh, as well as Eastern Europe and, and some Asian countries. Um, through that, I was attached to uh, the United States Army Intelligence Security Command, uh, which is basically the intelligence component of the Army. I know that's a joke, US Army intelligence or military intelligence. But uh, believe it or not, there is some smart uh, work that goes on there. Uh, I would say probably about 10% of the work we did was smart. But uh, we do get a chance to do a, a lot of fun things. But through that, I actually got augmented into the National Security Agency. That's the one that a lot of you probably hate uh, or, or you have your own opinions on. Um, the cool thing about the National Security Agency, though, is, is, is as an Army component, uh, member of the National Security Agency, I'm afforded the rights to do things like computer network exploitation and attack. Uh, so essentially, I get to be a hacker. So uh, as a company, we use the slogan, former hackers fighting hackers. We don't mean this in a hacker sense that we've kind of tweaked and tooled, but we literally mean it that the vast majority of our employees have awards sitting on their desk from anyone from the president to the prime ministers from foreign countries saying, hey, thanks for doing computer network attack and exploitation on our behalf. Uh, so in the truest of sense, uh, there's not a lot of people who can legally say they were hackers, and that's what we were. So I did spend time with the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, that's the one I probably will talk the least about, so we'll skip that. Uh, I've also done a lot of work with the FBI uh, on tracking down internal and external threats. Um, I won't mention any major projects, but uh, we did deal with uh, kind of homegrown uh, cyber threats, and, and particularly criminal groups that were using US resources to, to steal things. Um, another fun place I worked at was GCHQ, which is essentially the NSA equivalent for the UK. I spent a lot of time over in England uh, working on some fun projects, uh, and you know, I definitely would like to go back. It's a fun place to live. While I was working at the agency, though, uh, I was given the opportunity to medically retire. And with some friends, we were working on some software that, in typical government fashion, was uh, you know, a lot of just build software, you gotta let people bid on it. So our solution was to go back and start a company. Uh, so a bunch of us got together and started a company called 426, uh, building large scale data analytics platforms. Uh, so this is a Hadoop based platform that was taking computer network operations data. So network attack traffic, uh, network exploitation traffic, and even network defense stuff. So taking in threat feeds, uh, vulnerability scans, and kind of logs from uh, different resources and, and looking for, for weird relationships. Um, where we really made a breakthrough in that is uh, the biggest piece of, of security that's often overlooked in, in, in the IT world in particular is the human component uh, from an HR perspective, the behavioral patterns of you as a user. So one of the things that we looked at was uh, let's not focus just on finding a specific signature. Let's look for patterns of behavior. You know, certain users have tools, techniques, and procedures. So we spent time going through and understanding that and, and trying to correlate those patterns. Uh, very rudimentary at the time. Uh, we worked there. Fortunately, we were acquired by CSC fairly fast. Um, didn't stay there that long because I'm not a big fan of big scale defense contractors. I feel they kind of stimmy uh, a little bit of research and I decided it was time to move out. Uh, so when I left there, I actually went to work for another company called Alien Vault. Alien Vault makes OSIM, uh, which is a free platform available for system incident event management. 
So much like 426, where I worked at a company and we, I built a product where uh, we gathered data and kind of correlated it and produced security threats, uh, Alien Vault was doing the same thing. Uh, essentially, it was a network operations center or security operations center in a box. Uh, the premise being that most firms, uh, whether you could afford it or not, uh, have a need for network operations and security operations, uh, but they simply can't afford to put the staff uh, that were necessary. So it's it a very interesting background. So it's given me the experience of, of both working uh, operationally, uh, tactically, uh, offensively, and defensively. Um, and so I think that's, that's helped out quite a bit with where we're at. So some of the places that I've worked at in doing consulting and, and, and time, um, I've done some pretty big deals with uh, LinkedIn, uh, Google, Facebook, Apple, Yahoo, AT&T, Microsoft, and Sony. Uh, I think these are companies that everybody here knows, and, and these are companies that I can, I can acknowledge working on things. Um, done a lot of random things uh, for these different companies. Everything from general security consulting and, and kind of going through uh, situation room type planning of hypothetically what could happen here or what could happen there, uh, all the way down to, in the case of the, the lower right to Microsoft and Sony, working on how can I exploit uh, you know, the platforms they were building at the time. This was you know, prior to the Xbox coming out and, and, and the PlayStation coming out. Um, there's some very interesting things that uh, I got to work on that. Plus I got some free hardware. I mean, at the end of the day, who doesn't like free games and, and, and consoles? Uh, so it's been a very, very interesting exposure to the big companies. The one thing that's been really cool too about working with companies at this scale is, uh, I think everyone here will agree, the government, you know, you can have access to some pretty cool big large data sets, but everything is trumped by the commercial providers. Uh, the amount of data that Yahoo, Google, Facebook, Apple, LinkedIn, AT&T are, are capturing about every one of you right now uh, is insane. So, you know, whereas if I wanted to create uh, threat rules and correlation, you know, maybe I could generate uh, on a good day a couple hundred gigabytes of data. You go into these environments and you literally have access to petabytes of data that's spanning a globe, uh, which, is, which is insane. So um, that was part of the other reason why I was very happy to, to work with these different teams. So, the title of the talk, you spent $20,000 so that my throwaway email account can have full recon on your internal network. Long-winded, I know, uh, but I think the $20,000 point um, is an interesting one. So, what does this talk about? So this talk is essentially a real-life example of um, a creative deployment uh, from one of our clients. Um, that was kind of forced out of necessity, um, but it was also forced out of misrepresentation by a sales sales representative. Uh, I mean, someone in security selling security misrepresented their product or told you to do something wrong. I mean, who, who would figure that would ever happen, right? Uh, so, uh, a culmination of the two created a very unique situation for us um, that we were not even looking for. It just happened to come across in, in the process of a, of a normal investigation. Um, the big thing I want everyone to re remember is that whenever you make a decision uh, for security or, or concerns, there's always a secondary risk, right? The evidence of the absence of, of what you think is the risk doesn't mean that there isn't a risk, you know? Uh, so it's always good to have second eyes or, or kind of an outside perspective uh, on a lot of things that go on. Um, one of the big things that we face as, as security professionals is, is a lot of times we have to think about security not only from what we want to do, but we got to think of things like a budgetary constraints, um, maybe we have technology deployment constraints, uh, and, and sometimes we're just told, look, make it do something and think outside of the box. So uh, I don't fault this particular individual for how this, this kind of issue came up, um, but I think as a whole it's kind of systemic across our enterprise simply because we do have to patch things, we do have to kind of make things work as we go through. So, a lot of times you're sitting in the, the boardroom or you're sitting in the meetings and the first th thing you hear is, uh, hey guy, you know, IT guy, we need something because we've got some sort of uh, security audit coming up. You know, we've got some PCI audit or some HIPAA compliant. Right? Something, something business-wise is driving uh, the need for the security to start looking at things uh, and deploying solutions within uh, the enterprise. Um, one of the other things maybe security posturing. You know, some of our clients have, have, have been very reactive to some of the recent breaches. Uh, I mean, I think everyone here has, has heard, you know, everything from Sony to Anthem uh, to OPM and everything. Uh, clients are getting smarter and they're starting to ask questions. So um, when the C-suite that knows nothing about technology is starting to ask you about security, all of a sudden you have a, a need to, to start implementing it. And another one that we've actually seen that's been pretty consistent is people are starting to underwrite insurance policies. They need, as an IT firm, they need to have some sort of cybersecurity liability insurance. And so part of that is, is you have to come in and say, hey, we meet the criteria of A, B, and C uh, to get the policy uh, so that it's underwritten. And if anything uh, is consistent, uh, 
insurance will be changing and getting more difficult for everybody because the amount of payouts they're having to pay for, for hackers these days is, is ridiculous. So um, nine times out of 10, there's some sort of business need or policy driven reason as to why we've done that. So working through it, there's a lot of questions that are gonna pop up, right? So what are the things we have to consider? Um, here's me sitting in the middle with my confused face as everybody's yelling at me. Um, things I gotta think about are, what are the manpower requirements? Do I have the personnel, the staff, the people I need uh, to, to execute whatever this requirement is in, in, uh, in, in lieu of this assessment? What is the time in motion? I mean, it takes time to rack equipment and deploy it, uh, fix permissions and, and firewalls, pick, fix routing so that you you know have ex, uh, access to what you need to. Uh, maybe you gotta span some taps off network ports and you gotta you know route things for that. I mean, it takes time. Uh, I think all of us will agree that nothing is plug and play despite what they say in the box. Um, you know, we're always having to tinker and, and, and tweak with it. Um, a big one is reporting. You know, what is the end result? Who are the stakeholders that have some buy-in? Does the C-suite need a special type of report? Does the IT security staff need a special type of report? I mean, who are the people that are looking for, for the results for, for, for the audits uh, or the assessment or the deployment? Um, another thing to think about is, is what are we testing for? Are we looking for things like web application vulnerabilities? Or are, are we looking to harden uh, the existing systems that we have? Do we need to do vulnerability assessments on existing servers? Uh, needless to say, the point I'm trying to make is that there's millions of questions you can ask, and every time you answer one, there's gonna be 10 more subsequent questions that are gonna come up from it. So a, as a security analyst or a security uh, auditor or as a security implementation specialist, whatever your title may be, um, there's a lot of things you have to think about, and many times they're overlooked, or you try to find solutions that are going to fix those or make them a little bit faster for us. Um, and that's where we're at. So all things considered, uh, firms tend to purchase ready-made solutions. So that's where uh, every one of us can write you know, Python scripts or we can come up with a creative way of doing something better. But uh, just like the old adage of, of everybody can always develop software better, uh, until you do it, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, and given the time constraints most of us are facing, working 60, 80, 120 hours a week, it's not likely that we're gonna be able to build our own solutions to, to solve this. So what we do is we go out and we say, I'm gonna buy this magic box. I'm gonna buy this, you know, this network appliance that, that does everything. Or I'm going to buy this deployment uh, endpoint monitor that's going to solve this problem. Um, so, so we look for buying solutions, and, and of course, sales loves it because you know you're selling stuff, and, and people are going to buy it. Um, a lot of times, these are things that you start adding. You know, uh, the one thing that we've seen that's been pretty consistent too is there's now line items for security on, on the budgets of a lot of firms, and I don't just mean in you know uh, 10 million, 100 million, you know, 200 billion dollar firms. I'm talking companies that are worth uh, half a million dollars or a quarter of a million dollars are thinking about, all right, well, what kind of security appliance can we buy for two grand or five grand to secure us? Because I think at the end of the day, consumers are smarter now and realize that everybody's a threat. Uh, and a good example of that would be you know Target getting breached not through Target but through a third party. Party provider. I guarantee you that heating and air, air conditioning specialist company had no clue about security and had no thought to buy into things. Um, now companies like that that generally don't have that exposure are having to think about these questions. So automated vulnerability scans is where we're at. This is one of the things that a lot of people love because, I mean, who doesn't love automation? If I can throw in a couple IPs or I can click a button in a GUI that says, hey, Scan it all up for me, it saves me time. I don't have to write Python scripts. Um, there's a lot of different ways these technologies are, are, are made available to us. You've got hosted deployed internally, so you can have uh, a hardware appliance you buy that, that automates scans and, and kind of assessments inside of your network. Uh, you've got virtualization solutions, so if you've deployed VMware, vSphere, uh, or any one of the open source variants of that, you can deploy it. Um, there's even, you know, people have got some custom Docker containers that you can throw out some of these assessment tools uh, that are out there. Uh, you kind of have two, two, two families though of products that are available. And kind of the free side, uh, and then you've got the, the, the paid to play. So the benefit of the free side is obviously that it's free. The cost there is your time in motion and um, experience. So, so once again, one of the problems we're trying to solve is uh, improving security with the least amount of time and effort put into it. So while open source is great and most of us are champions of it in smaller networks, it's just not feasible for big deployments. Uh, so, so that's where the paid kind of vendors come in. And on the paid side, you've got some pretty cool products uh, in the case of automated assessments and, and vulnerability scanning. And um, I'm sure many of you will have tons of products that you've used and, and, and prefer. Uh, but some of the big tier people that, that are out there providing stuff uh, are um, 
Uh, Tenable provides solutions, obviously, uh, through the Nessus line. Uh, they've got everything from cloud hosted to internal. Um, you've got Qualys, who's a, an event sponsor here, provides solutions, you know, web hosted and also internal solutions. Um, and then you've got, uh, you know, you've got some custom third party roll your own distributions that people have, have written. I mean, there's a bunch of um, uh, people who are selling essentially Kali scripts and they really send you a, an ISO image of, of Kali they've customized with, with vulnerability scans that run on, run on a boot. Um, is that really a paid solution? I don't know. You know, there's not a lot of support, in, but people are paying for those things. Um, some of the other big ones too are, are people like GFI uh, Landguard is a is a product that a lot of people are deploying to to, to manage automation um, and Retina. The benefit of some of these things though, like GFI and Retina, is they actually kind of cross over into other needs. So uh, not only do we find vulnerabilities and do these assessments and, and see if we're compliant, you know, making sure the systems are hardened, but some of these actually have the ability to go down and force updates and deployments. Because um, once again, one thing that's not consistent uh, across the board in most networks is, is the fact that while we do Windows updates individually on a computer, a lot of times the policy is not there to enforce users. Uh, and a big example of that is, is the growing use of, of Apple laptops and, and, and Linux-based distributions in the network. Uh, people don't understand the update processes to begin with or, or the repackaging and distribution. So um, anytime there's free tools or, or even paid tools that can help uh, an IT admin that doesn't have the experience work through that, uh, it's a good experience at all. So these are great solutions. Each with pros and cons. So to give you give you a little perspective of the story, um, what we're going over here is we've got a client that we worked with that um, was actually suffering from a breach, uh, doing some open source threat intelligence. Um, we had tracked down uh, particular evidence that a nation state threat actor had had breached and compromised the network. Uh, and over time, we, we eventually built up enough evidence to find out the origination point, uh, including administrator passwords and things that had been leaked out uh, to this third party source. So we reached out and of course, immediately like we're not hacked and uh, about you know 20 minutes later after a nice PGP encrypted email with a dump of passwords, they called us back and go, okay, can you get out here tomorrow? So what did we do? We flew out in 12 hours and we got there. Um, <laughs> security auditing is fun. Uh, incident response is even, even more fun uh, because chances are the vast majority of people don't realize they've been breached and they've been breached for a sustainable amount of time. Um, but one of the things that happens is because of inexperience, we get into a uh, fight or flight mode and, and because we want to fight, immediately we start changing infrastructure and changing things and reconfiguring. Um, and that's going to come into play uh, as we talk more about this presentation. This particular threat actor group here that that um, that we were tracking down uh, is is a uh, Asian-based threat actor group. Um, very low tech on how they pop the networks to start with. They tend to look for uh, vulnerabilities in PHP, web vulnerabilities, um, and things like that uh, to pop. But then they, once they've got their stage one implant, then they start spreading the network. And of course, as any anyone in here that does pen testing knows, the first thing I would target is if I can find a domain controller, I'm going to whack that because the domain controller is going to be keys to the castle. So they've got a pretty consistent uh, tools, technique, and procedure that they follow. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to read. So we're very fortunate in that we knew how they were trying to propagate inside of the network. Um, the one thing that you do run into is many times once they get to the kind of that stage two or stage three, they start leveraging existing credentials and it makes it a little bit tougher. Uh, but knowing some of the patterns and behaviors of the users and then combining that with the patterns and behaviors of the threat actor makes it a little bit easier to, to kind of decipher. So here we are. So we like free intelligence. As we're sitting there, we were talking to the customer and, and pulling down data. And if any of you ever have done a forensic investigation, uh, when you're using write blockers, uh, small little devices to capture and, 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 and duplicate hard drives and, and, and data off of the system, they take ungodly amounts of time, anywhere from eight hours to 20 hours, sometimes 48 hours to run. So while we're on site, rather than just sit there and twiddle our thumbs, we're constantly looking for ways to engage the client. Uh, one of the things we spend a lot of time on with incident response is not understanding only the breach and understanding the network, but actually understanding the business and understanding the use cases. Uh, and the reason that's important is we get to understand uh, what, is, what is going on and what's expected behavior and what's not. You know, uh, While it may seem ridiculous to share a password, we all think that's, that's, that's foolish, finding out that there's a business need for it or there was a reason they did that, whether right or wrong, uh, is very valuable because it could save us time on, on kind of our investigation. So one of the things I love to do is I love to look at Qualys uh, free scans uh, amongst a bunch of other ones. Um, in this particular instance, we had asked the client for a bunch of their internal kind of vulnerability scans they had, previous pen tests, and lo and behold, they didn't have them. Um, you know, uh, this day and age, you, you think people would have them, but they don't. So they didn't have any documentation. They did have kind of some summary reports that they had run from a, a previous scan, uh, and they had briefly mentioned that they had used Qualys, but they didn't really have the credentials for it. Somebody wasn't in the office, and uh, needless to say, there wasn't a whole lot of intelligence. So as we're working on the internal network, we, we were curious as to potentially if there were any vulnerabilities or breaches on the outside network. So 
working smarter, not harder, I said, okay, why don't we just go ahead and leverage one of these free uh, scanning utilities on the outside? So one of the things that we did was we actually registered an account, just a throwaway account with Qualys. Uh, you can't use Google, you can't use Yahoo, but I mean, a domain you can get for two bucks sometimes on sale. So if you don't have a whole bunch of sync hold throwaway domains, get in the habit of it because it's great for one-time uses and projects that you need. So I went ahead and I used a, a, an email address that we had set up for this engagement and created a, a Qualys free scan account. And simple, you get 10 free scans, you throw in an IP and you're good to go. So when we popped in, Qualys offered us a free, free opportunity to do the vulnerability scan, uh, the OWASP software scan, uh, patch, patch scans obviously, and, and SCAP compliance, part of the NIST kind of framework of, of instruction. When we were looking at it, you know, for us, really all we were concerned about ultimately was the vulnerabilities to see if there are any gaping, gaping holes uh, that we should look at first and foremost, uh, because time is of the essence. So we gathered the information from the client. We got the front-facing IP uh, of their router from, from their provider. It was a static IP. It was great. Uh, hadn't changed. Um, so there we go. So one of the things that we did is we, we dropped their IP in and immediately got a response, right? Yay, no high risks, but all of a sudden there's 24 vulnerabilities. Um, that's not too uncommon. I think most people here know a lot of times the low risk and even the medium risk vulnerabilities, um, they could be very hypothetical and they don't necessarily mean they're actionable. Uh, there's no way to have zero really at the end of the day and, and have a truly functional network. There's always going to be concerns. Um, but this was kind of a red flag for us because the way it was explained to us with the existing network, they had uh, a, a Juniper firewall that sat between everything, uh, between the gateway uh, and, and the end users. And in that firewall, there was only open access for uh, two, two open VPN servers and two proxy servers. So curiosity would say, if you've got open VPN servers and proxy servers, um, maybe one of them is pop. So let's see if there's a vulnerability that we could find on there. Nope. It wasn't uh, anything to do with OpenVPN or the proxy servers. Uh, what we found, as you can see here, is we found WordPress <laughs> vulnerabilities, we found PHP configuration vulnerabilities, uh, we had some serious SSL issues uh, internally as well. And so the concern started kind of shifting my perspective of, hey, wait a second, you, know, you guys told me you don't have any of this equipment in here, you know, this is running on the gateway can you double check and, and, and make sure stuff's not here? Meanwhile, I'm gonna run another scan just in case, you know, heaven forbid, somebody gave me the wrong report in, in the platform. So we started talking to the, 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 the administrators and that's when we kind of got a, a sense that even though they're administrators running a virtualized environment, uh, I don't know if any of you have worked it with ESXi or vSphere or any of the, those tools, um, there was a large number of systems that were unaccounted for. So, the fact that we brought up that we found WordPress and all these documents was immediately discredited. Um, so we ran the scan again and got the same results. And so in pushing back, we actually found out that there was existing development machines. So some of the developers had just spun up their own instances. So where they gave rights to every user in here as a user essentially could spin up their own machines in the network and they could do whatever they wanted. Um, that's a security concern. Obviously, if you're, if, you know, if you're a $200 million company or larger and you've got every user can pretty much build whatever they want on the network, that's concerning. Um, in the investigation, we found some really cool things like reverse proxies where people were calling back to their own homes uh, because they wanted to bypass security control. So who cared if they had their own proxies? Like, well, I'll just make a backdoor myself. That's how I get in. Um, and the argument was, well, we didn't know. He's, he, he's the, you know, the, this guy at IT, he's a senior VP or something. You know, he, he has the rights to do that. You know, he's smart. Great. If I could tell you how many smart people I've convinced to click a free ad email and, and fish them, like, you know, like smart, smart and, and, and street smart are two different things. Um, and then we found a bunch of boxes that were sitting around. And, and interesting enough, we found probably 30 to 40 percent of the stuff that was running in their network, one, they didn't realize was there, and two, had no reason to be running. These were things that somebody had spun up because they wanted to test something, like they were staging uh, a design for a plugin for the website, or they were staging something internally they were working on. Uh, one of them actually was like something that was an unrelated project to even the company. It was just some random website the guy was developing and just happened to have a box running inside the network. Is this a huge concern if, if the outside of the network is secure? No, but if I can access these machines from the outside and they're vulnerable because people are not actively maintaining uh, and, and, and monitoring them, it does open a, a, a big gaping hole for us here. So working with the client, we validated that the firewall was in place and functioning. So we looked at, looked at everything and said, okay, it's there. You're sure it's running? And like, yep, it's good to go. She said, all right, let's run the other scan. Let's see what's, you know, see what's popping up. Uh, got the same results. 
So I even went further and said, okay, well, let me try to scan up the machine from a hosted VPS. So I went on DigitalOcean, paid five bucks, threw up an Ubuntu machine, SSH to it, and just said, okay, let me just start trying to scan it up uh, remotely. Didn't get the same results. So now we're stuck in a dilemma. Is it the Qualys free scan that's giving me a bad result? Or is it, you know, my tool that I'm running in DigitalOcean giving me a bad result? Given that they're saying the environment is secure and that we've got these firewalls in place, you know, I'm leaning to say, well, the chances of the, the Linux scan results being wrong are, are, are probably a lot slimmer. It could just be a simple misconfiguration. Maybe some table got crossed in the database and I'm getting someone else's report. I don't know if anyone here has worked with Juniper equipment before, but it's a headache and you probably will touch it once every six years of that and then you go back and look at it and you forget everything and you have to re kind of process through it. So that's kind of what we did. So we went back and we said, uh-oh, so the snozberries don't actually taste like snozberries. So little, little Wonka reference there if you don't get it. We, we, took the, uh, we took the firewall configs and started walking backwards and rebuilding it, trying to figure out what was going on. We said, okay, something's, something's in here. Something, you know, something just doesn't make sense. Um, and it was one of those moments where you sit there and you kind of you face palm and you're like, there's no way this is going to be the case. Like you're looking through, you see a rule for here, a rule for there. Uh, they had the right rules in place for the proxies. They had the right rules in place for the, the, the open VPNs. They had one particular rule that didn't really make sense. And we're like, okay, so why are you whitelisting this one IP range to have access into the network? So that kind of threw us off, and that's when it kind of started clicking. We're like, wait a second, you've whitelisted, you've whitelisted a whole range of IPs. Okay. I will keep keep uh, one one pertinent piece of information is this particular piece of equipment they bought on Craigslist. Uh, and they had actually not wiped it, they simply modified some of the configurations on it. So there was remnants from the previous user. So we thought maybe, just maybe, it just happened to be something left over from a previous user. But I think anybody in here that does security work knows that, one, if you buy something on Craigslist, be very, very cautious. And two, what is the first thing you do with a new computer or device? You wipe it and you reinstall the firmware. They had done neither. Um, they'd actually gone one further in that they had a security system they had inherited in the building uh, that pre existed prior to them joining in. And rather than, you know, keeping it segmented off the network, uh, they said, sure, we'll just add it to Active Directory. It's a Windows 2003 box. It'll never cause any trouble, right? I mean, that's a paradise for anybody in here who's a pen tester. It's like, great, keys to the castle. You've added me to Active Directory, and now I've got a box. This is, this is perfect, perfect scenario. So seeing a kind of a repeat pattern here, we started saying, okay, well, maybe the crazy stuff isn't so crazy. Let's just really go through this and, and, and reiterate. So we had two of the analysts uh, and myself sat down, and we, we, we kind of went through these, these, these logs. And I went back in the server room, and I was, I was doing some data capture, and, and one of the guys came in, and he goes, all right, I'm going to show you this, and don't laugh at me because it's been a long time since I've lived at Juniper. Is this an allow all rule for this, this range? I said, yes, it is. So we went back and we said, okay, this in fact is an allow all rule. So this, this white listed range that they had put in here basically was going to allow any incoming and outcoming traffic in, in, into the, the router without any authentication. The only authentication required was simply that the IP was the originating source. So. Everyone gets a trophy here if you can guess uh, where this is going. Um, it turns out that the configuration was set up for whitelisting Qualys and scan servers. Why would you whitelist the servers of a scan tool in your internal network? So it didn't really make sense to me. And then I started thinking, well, no, actually it makes absolute sense. At some point, somebody had a budget constraint. They were willing to pay for Koala services, but maybe they didn't want to pay for the internal hosted because they didn't have the finance. Or maybe a creative sales guy on the other side said, hey, I've got this product here. I know you really need internal scanning, but check this out. If you open up and whitelist these IPs that I give you, I give you rather, um, uh, you'll be able to do an internal scan with our external tool. And I think in, in this particular instance, that's what's happened. So here I am, you know, you can't really see, it's a little bit blurry here, but uh, Mr. Robot at fsociety.dat, uh, that's, my, that's my email address. You know. uh, I'm able to go ahead and sign up and, and do my scan. So the issue we run into here is that with Qualys, a free scan and a paid scan leverage the same infrastructure. That by inherent nature is not wrong. It's, just, it's a fantastic product. They have to have a barrage of servers that they're using to constantly do these vulnerability scans and do 24-7 checks. There is nothing wrong with that design and that architecture. Um, anybody can sign up for screen, free scan. There's nothing wrong with that because at the end of the day, a Qualys scan is no different than anything you can do from your own computer. If you are touching the wide area network of the internet, 
uh, you got to expect you're getting scanned. I mean, how many people in here probably get popped every 20 seconds looking for random exploits? My favorite are, are the guys in China that are throwing, uh, you know, Windows exploits at a Linux box nonstop and not wondering why they're not getting anywhere. I mean, you see this stuff all day. Like, so, so that's not uncommon. Scanning is there. So once again, no fault on Qualys for doing that. Um, the other part, anybody can scan an IP. Well, once again, why not? An IP is... You know, it's public information. You can scan an IP. What does Qualys have to do to stop you from scanning? Sure, they may stop it or blacklist your IP, but no one else can. Uh, you're just going to get the full scan. So essentially what happens is, in this particular instance, because they had whitelisted the uh, Qualys scans uh, uh, network, when I went through and created our fake throwaway account and I scanned their IP, as a free user, I had full recon of their whole network, and I had the full vulnerability, I had network maps, I had all the topology that I could generate from the simple scan. Because at some point, a security analyst said, hey, I gotta save some money, I'm gonna open up this whitelist. And because of that, as an attacker, I now have this whole plethora of, of information about your network for the low, low price of free. It's a pretty, pretty big concern. So the, the, the moral of the story is, is that we all have to face security assessments. We have to do a security audit, and we have to work through a lot of these things, oftentimes with no time, no funding, and no budget. But I, I implore you to get a second opinion and think about this, because while this is a very low-tech talk in, in principle, I, I think everyone here, once again, as a security auditor or an analyst, is going to agree that the fact that here is a product that's actually being used the right way can be leveraged maliciously is the simple mindset of a hacker to begin with. Uh, so whitelisting a, a hosted solution on the outside to use it internally is not, not the best so uh, with that, is any questions you may have about security, incident response, consulting, or some of our experiences? Uh, this is a very short talk. I like to keep it short and sweet because I know how they go and, and overwhelm us. Uh, anybody have questions? Yeah. Hey, um, so that client, um, you were brought in originally because they had been breached. I mean, is the, is That's correct. Was the thought that the uh, attacker had, had discovered that Qualys had been whitelisted through and they were using it? No, not, not, that had nothing really to do with anything. At oh. the end of the day, it was simply just a resource. So, you know, incident response is, is interesting because everyone's going to have their own playbook. Everybody has like a NIST standard. They have a guideline. You can read a report from Mandiant. You can read a report from us. You can read a report from just about any firm out there. Uh, and they're probably all going to look different the way they approach it, right? It's, it's all tools, techniques, and procedures. We all have unique trade craft. We have unique tools that we like to run through. In this particular instance, we knew that there was an internal compromise. Uh, we had access to visibility to uh, level two exfiltration, level three kind of exfiltration uh, backbones that were being leveraged by this threat actor. We had visibility into it. And so because we could see all this different traffic, uh, we didn't always see the origination point because of staging. So what I mean by that is uh, there was always a middleman that we may not have seen. So the first IP that exfiltrated data came from, which would potentially have logs of, of the source, uh, we didn't have visibility into that. So all we actually had were uh, usernames, credentials, uh, and, and domain names and things like that. But of course, through the power of open source intelligence, we were able to eventually uh, figure out who the client was and notify them. Uh, but given that, we had no idea of how they potentially got breached. Uh, the most logical was it was either phishing or, or uh, vulnerabilities of, of popping it. Because the threat actor that we, we, we did find in there that we were monitoring, they have a very specific set of skills, uh, a very specific set of tools. Um, I would argue you could actually tell which level of operator or, or uh, exploit, exploiter uh, for the team is, is doing the, the engagement simply based upon the way they move. You can tell when they're running scripts versus when they're kind of going on the fly trying to uh, do SQL injection on their own and, and, and find vulnerabilities. So uh, in this particular instance, this was the very early stage uh, evidence that we had of, of kind of like a spray and pray environment. So uh, for us getting on site and having a very limited access to one, there was essentially no logging in the environment. Um, we had structural changes to the, uh, the IT staff that didn't really understand the, the network. Um, we had legacy hardware that had been inherited they had no clue really about. And then we had devices they had been buying on Craigslist they had no clue about. Given that, we had to grasp at whatever intelligence we, we could find. Uh, I think in, in the incident response world, a lot of it is just throwing a bunch of hypotheses on the wall and then working back and, and kind of through deductive analysis saying, okay, we found something that would destroy this narrative and destroy this narrative to help kind of hone in. Otherwise, in an environment like this, 
you can go in for incident response, and, and as a lot of a lot of our, our competitors would do, they would go in and say, okay, well, you've got a corporate network. We don't know the, the level of breach. We're going to immediately charge it, you know, 5,000 hours and, and say it's going to take 48 hours per system. Well, it does take 48 hours per system. I mean, 5,000 hours of work up front that's not needed is 5,000 hours of work that's not needed. More importantly, who's going to have the time to do all that work? Uh, most of us are on backlogs. I, the average incident response uh, can be two to three weeks uh, for some of the firms before they can get out there simply because of the amount of breaches that are going on. So we kind of do a different methodic approach to where we go and we say we know it was attacked and we kind of build backwards to kind of map out the network, um, particularly once again from our, our in inherent knowledge of having worked these threat actor groups. Uh, this particular group, um, I've been following iterations of it for 12 years, right? I, I could, and I won't, but I could name particular key individuals who've invested uh, in the people that are doing the attacks, uh, particular people who are very complacent with allowing the attacks to happen, uh, including the fact that, you know, the group is run by uh, a, a cousin uh, of, of a local kind of uh, dignitary, and so that's why they're trying to give them free reign to do these things. So it's using that information and that kind of historic uh, experiences to try to figure out what can we decipher. And in this instance, we said, look, we don't know anything about the external gateway, and you can't provide it. So simply using a free tool that was there, it did something for me that I didn't have the time to do. It gave me a little bit more information and access. How many nation state threat actors are you currently tracking? So when I say we're tracking nation state threat actors, um, we're not just tracking anybody and everybody. We're, we're tracking the highest of the high. So uh, when I worked for the National Security Agency, I worked in a division called Tailored Access Operations. Um, I'm not going to go into the elaborates of, of, of too much information, but basically that was the Computer Network Exploitation and Attack Division. Uh, within there, I focused specifically on counter computer network exploitation. Um, so uh, without getting too technical, my job was to understand and hack the hackers, right? Um, it's not always easy to find the victims, but if you can attack the attacker and figure out what they're doing, um, you can kind of uh, get an end result. So going through that, a lot of times we have to qualify and, and, and quantify what a threat level is from a, an attacker, right? You've got your script kitties. I think we've all seen that. You've got your simple things that Norton's going to catch or whatever security gateway. And then you've got your persistent attackers that are going to get in and they're going to drop one tool. Uh, it's going to be memory resident. It's not going to stay in the box, which is what these guys actually do once they get, once they get internal access. And then they're going to use your creds. They're going to use your network against you. They're doing recon. They're pulling down your historic reports that you shared in the documents and drives, and they're building a network map. So if you talk about nation state people like that, that have the time, the expertise, uh, and the experiences to look at that, uh, right now I'm tracking between 240 and 243 different discernible groups. And these are people who are well-funded and have the resources. Many of them are actually next door neighbors and competing. Uh, what's interesting is you can find in some of the military kind of organizations that are fighting, uh, you've got one unit here that wants to get involved, one unit here that wants to get involved, the one unit here that wants to get involved, and they're fighting each other. You can sometimes see them getting on the boxes and, and knocking each other's tools out, you know, and totally destroy, destroying the access. But that actually doesn't sound all that crazy because if you think about it here, even within the US, as we stood up Cyber Command, you had components from the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, and even the Marine Corps, that, and, and the Coast Guard, believe it or not, even, uh, wanting to do these kind of operations. They're all competing. So it, it's actually not that crazy. So when you look at it, I, 243 sounds like a lot. When you realize how many countries are out there and how cheap it is for anybody to buy an exploit toolkit, I mean, you just call up Vupin and say, hey, I want to buy a couple zero days, and here's Hack Team. They're going to give you some, <laughs> some infrastructure to, to call back and exfiltrate. Boom. You got a CNO shop in a box, right, for a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, but we don't, we don't focus on a lot of those tools. While we have the intelligence on that, we partner with other people who do. Uh, we like to consider ourselves the surgeons. We're going after the big, the big fish and understanding them. Uh, we spend a lot of time operationally staging ourselves around the globe in between where they're sitting at and partnering with intel, uh, intellectual property providers such as ISPs uh, and even companies to say, hey, you've been breached. Um, let's kind of sinkhole this. Rather than throwing a honeypot, you've got a live network that's been breached. Let's mitigate it as best we can internally, but the intelligence that we're going to you know, pull from this is going to be far greater uh, than the risk you have here. And so we work with them to kind of coordinate how to get from there. Because um, at the end of the day, every one of the operations that we work on uh, benefits prior clients we have and current clients we have. Because the change of techniques and procedures between each operation uh, gives us a new MO to look at. And so we can go back historically and say, hey, this new breach, they used a new tool. Maybe we can find variants of it that we hadn't realized were there before. So, answer it. Another one? Yeah, so, so you've identified this at a client site. Yeah. How does that conversation go? That's a very tough one, right? So if, if you're in security and you call up and say, hey, you've been hacked, the first thing is, well, you're just trying to sell me security services. So we've got a lot of relationships uh, and partners in, in, in industry that we've worked with. Um, I can count them on the hand, the ones that I trust. 
and I know that sounds bad, but uh, in the environment that I've worked in, in, in the places I've been at, you know, uh, both in the military as well as, you know, in, in the NSA, it's a very close-knit group of people, much like your offices are now. I mean, you've got security teams of two to three people. You guys are in the trenches with each other every day. You've got that trust relationship. Um, the one thing that we see that's consistent, though, is, is the vast majority of products simply don't work or people can't figure out how to use them. So we don't like to partner with those kind of companies uh, and, and, and kind of share information, obviously, because there's not a lot we're going to get out of it. And more importantly, we tend to tend to pick up a lot of the heavy weight lifting. Uh, they want all of our, our, our indicators of compromise to deploy in their product, but they don't want to supply us with, with the same. And nine times out of 10, they don't have anything to supply us. Uh, so it's hard to get them to implement it. Um, or they want exclusive rights to it, which, you know, if we're going to use it, all of our clients have access to all that information and, and we're going to propagate it as we can uh, with least amount of, of risk. Um, I would say that uh, some of our partnerships that we have um, have, have been very fruitful. Um, you know, some of the commentary that comes up a lot of times is everyone fears the NSA and what they can and can't collect. And I can tell you, to do operations, I mean, the amount of legalese that I had to go through just to get permission to click enter on a keyboard for one very simple thing was a lot. It was tough. It's, n it's not spray and pray. Um, in the civilian world here, in the commercial world, you would be surprised what people will sell you access to. And so our partners have worked with building network taps and gateway taps at simply the right price. You can get information. Uh, we find a lot of third world countries, uh, corrupt people that are running the malicious software, you can turn them just as easily as anyone else. I mean, a lot of your phishing sites intend to originate you know, in Africa and in, in Eastern European regions for a reason, because there is no rules and controls. And so we partner with people who are staged in those countries and, and kind of have um, relationships to be able to get that information. Um, I don't argue with where it comes from sometimes. I just let it be. That's just the nature of things. Uh, but we immediately turn back and access and, and action it. So, but we, we keep everything on the up and up. We don't hack anybody, I promise. Not unless you pay us for a pen test or a hunt team operations. <laughs> so, any other questions? Security questions. concerns? Yes? How many years would it take to get the uh, IPs to whitelist to start doing internal scans? I'm sorry, what was the question? How many beers would it take to get the IPs of Wallace? <laughs> One? You know, I, so I don't like to sell information. I feel like that's a risk. Uh, I would much rather freely make it available to you if, if you would like to talk offline. Um, uh, I have made disclosure and I have sent the proper information out uh, to the people. Because once again, this isn't necessarily a fault of Qualys. This, this is a fault of the implementation, right? But it's very, very curious, to say the least. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't charge you a beer for that, I, I bet you. Uh, instead, I would just, you know, say, do something cool with it or whatever. Or maybe don't. Don't tell me. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of the questions. Any other questions about instant response? Or? Uh, doesn't IP, doesn't Qualys publish that list? They, they might actually have a published list. To, you know, like if you have an actual engagement, you know, I, did, I believe it's public information. Right, I think so. I think there are, the majority of it probably is. I, I didn't actually take the time to, to go through a lot of it to figure out the why thing because at the end of the day, I didn't have any issue with Qualys. Whether it was publicly available or not, there was no fault on their end. Uh, it, it doesn't impact operations uh, whatsoever. Uh, it would make sense they would have that because potentially, somebody else scans your network because they use the free scan, you're going to want to know who that, oh, it came from Qualys, and you can always go back and figure it out. Um, but, but as a whole, that's it's just an interesting situation to be in. I, you know, I, here we are looking for the most complex of complex, and it's just a simple thing in front of us like that. And of course, we found dozens uh, of those things that, as we all know, that like Lego bricks stacked together, they build a bigger picture when you, when you put it together. Okay. Everything? Cool. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and if you have any further questions, you can feel free to reach us. We have a little booth outside and we can talk. Uh, spent a lot of time doing a lot of cool security stuff, and I'm sure a lot of you have too. Um, one thing I will bring up is, is as a local Charleston-based company, we actually uh, started a nonprofit called Node SC. Um, you'll see on the signs here it says Node SC. That's how we, we helped get the room uh, into cooperations with B-Size. One of the things that we're doing is we're actually getting ready to open, I hate the term cyber, but it seems to be the term that, that's necessary to get grant funding, a cybersecurity center of operations. Um, we're going to have two one gigabyte lines connected to about $6 million of infrastructure for you to hack and whack and do whatever you want. Uh, in addition, we've got partner groups that we're working with so that you're going to be able to go out uh, and you want to play with some SCADA equipment. How many of you have access to you know half a million dollars of SCADA equipment? We've got partnerships we're working on to, to get access to that. So if these are the kinds of things you like and you'd like to share the knowledge, uh, the way that we improve things and we, we mitigate a lot of these threats is by sharing that. And I think I think we've got to get over this. I'm the coolest guy in the office. Uh, I'm not going to share my experiences, my exposure, and instead we have to start talking about it because I think what we're going to find as, as we talk more and more is that we're all victims of the same kind of tools, techniques, and patterns. And if we collectively, uh, you know, kind of 
solidify our, 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 our techniques of detection, uh, we'll make it a little bit harder for the attackers and make them move on to the next guy. Uh, that's, that's one last little plug there for that. So. All right, thanks everybody. We're also hiring any